and how you will also judge if you have gotten there. All right, so now let's think about the big stumbling blocks to happiness, and these stumbling blocks are universal. The first is we can reason our way to happiness. Now, when you were growing up, or even now, how many of you, when you're trying to make a difficult decision, pull out a piece of paper or maybe do a mental, mental calculation and run the pros and cons analysis? If the answer is yes, clap your hands. All right, so a lot of you do this. This is normal, right? You were taught this probably in school, right? Does it help? Yes? Tell me about it. I want to hear how it helps, when it helps, when did it not help? Uh -huh. um, I think it helps when, when the pros and cons can be equally weighted, but I mm -hmm. think like a lot of times the pros or cons are, are not weighted equally. Okay, so you have trouble when it's they're weighted unequally, then it's like, how do I deal with this? Yeah. Okay? What else? Andres, I think it helps when the thing you want is has more pros than the cons. <laughs> <laughs> we call that the dominating alternative. <laughs> Okay, he's saying it helps if it becomes clear which one's the dominating alternative. Someone else? Carrie. Usually putting it all on paper makes me more confused. The only way it helps is if writing it down actually um, stimulates my intuition and my gut. That's the only way it helps, otherwise it just makes me more confused. Now why does it make you more confused to jot it all down? Uh, so you're looking at the pros and the cons, and you're saying, oh my god, which way do I go? Okay? Maybe one more. Andrew. Um, I think the bigger the decision is, the less helpful it is. Like, if I'm making a pros and cons list about what to eat for dinner, like, that's helpful. <laughs> like, depending on what I'm in the mood for. But if I'm thinking about where to go to grad school or, like, what job to pick, it is not helpful. Okay, so you're saying the, the bigger the decision, the less helpful it is. You know what you're really saying? What you're really saying is the closer that decision becomes related to my happiness, the harder it becomes to use the pros and cons analysis. Now, why do we use pros and cons analysis? Why is it so popular? It's certainly been around for the ages, but the one who most popularized the use of the pros and cons analysis was really this guy, Benjamin Franklin. We all know Benjamin Franklin. He was once asked by a, a friend of his, you know, he, he was asked for help on what to choose. And his response was, look, I can't tell you what to choose, but I can tell you how to choose. And that my way is to take a sheet of paper and to break it up into two parts, pros on the one side, cons on the other side. And now over the course of four days, I think of all the various pros and cons. And where I and and I also start to attach weights to these different pros and cons. Where one pro is equal to a con, I cross them both out. Where two pros are equal to one con, I cross those three out. Where two pros are equal to three cons, I cross all five out. And then I find the balance. And he referred to this as a kind of moral or prudential algebra. Well. One of the greatest decision analysts of the 20th century was a guy named Howard Rafa. He was the guy that essentially came up with the tools for how we do modern day decision analysis. It's the underpinnings, of financial models, any kind of decision analysis where it's essentially set up in a software program. Regressions, statistics, many, many tools have been created as a function of Howard Rafa's method of doing decision analysis. But one day, Howard Rafa had a very important decision he had to make. And he was sitting, and he was actually a Columbia professor, by the way. And he was supposedly, the story goes, sitting down in the Columbia Business School dean's office. He had an important choice to make. He had to decide whether he was going to accept this new offer to go to the Harvard Business School or stay at Columbia Business School. 
And he asked the dean, well, okay, what should I do? What should I choose? And the dean was his good friend. And the dean turned to him all surprised. He goes, well, can't you just throw this into your decision model? That'll tell you which one you should choose. <laughs> and he said, no, but this is a real decision. <laughs> He ended up going to Harvard, by the way. <laughs> um, a few years ago, Rachel Wells and Barry Schwartz and I, fellow collaborators, we did a study where we followed graduating seniors, undergraduates, as well as MBA students from 11 different institutions around the country. And they were all looking for a job. They were in their final year, they were all looking for a job, and we followed them throughout their last year. Now we divided up these graduating students into two groups, the maximizers and the satisfizers. Now the maximizers are the people that really do a reasoned analysis. They do the pros and cons lists, they consult with the career counselors, they consult industry rankings, they do a lot of networking, they, they file resumes with as many companies as possible. These guys do the works. The satisfiers are the people that say, you know what, if it sounds good, I'll apply. You know what, if that seems good enough, that's fine, I'll do that. Right, so very different attitudes about finding their jobs. Now, if you look at their numbers, I think many people would say that the maximizers did better. On average, they got 20% higher salaries. That, to me, seems like quite a bit of a success story, wouldn't you say? And by the way, we did this study even during a down economy, and they do better. They got more job offers, they got higher salaries. But when we asked them how satisfied they were with their jobs, how committed they were to the job offers that they accepted, now you saw the opposite effect. The satisficers were happier. Why do you think that is? Our maximizers tend to compare their salary to other people's salary. And then when they feel their salary is less than their, their peer, maybe they feel unsatisfied. unsatisfied. In case you're yeah, satisfied, maybe they might not compare. And then <laughs> they will evaluate their, like, their salary by their absolute value, and then they might feel happier. OK, so you're saying part of it has to do with social comparison, right? That, you know, I want to be like those guys. By the way, even when we looked at that, it turned out that they were still more miserable. That certainly does play a role, though. Okay. Why else? Melissa. I think maximizers have this rational model that makes it easier for them to justify their choice to others, but they're not thinking, they're overlooking their own happiness when they make the choice. Okay. So what you're saying here is really important. What's your name again? Melissa. Melissa. What Melissa's saying here is really important. What she's saying here is that when you use a pros and cons analysis, what you will maximize on is on criteria which is measurable, criteria which is concrete. But you know what? happiness or emotions more emotions more generally I don't know how to concretize them I don't know how to measure them and so they don't go into my equation here's my first tip for the night <coughs> that is that when trying to decide what will make you happy while it is the case that gut will not be a reliable measure for what makes you happy. Here's what gut is very reliable on. If you're thinking, if you really don't like that thing and it's making you miserable, don't ignore it. Gut is actually quite reliable in telling you what makes you miserable. All right, let's continue to look at this idea of how reason can affect our choices, particularly in the happiness domain. Now let's move from careers to the other topic that we all love to talk about, finding our soulmate, right? romantic love. 
There's a study done by Wilson and his colleagues in which they looked at couples. And they looked at couples in college as well as 